Hello, welcome back, welcome to another vlog. I will say my downstairs neighbour's in a very good mood today and he keeps having a sing-along so I'm trying to film in between that. I hope you had a lovely festive season. This one looked very different for me and my mum. We, you might know if you follow me on Instagram that my dad passed away from terminal illness last year and we made the decision a few weeks before Christmas that we just wanted to do something completely different rather than stay at home and pretend everything's the same when it's not. We booked a cruise. <laughs> Now this is slightly bonkers for me, the last time I flew was the beginning of 2018 and the last time I went on a cruise, I have done a few cruises before, my mum's always been big into cruising and I have done a couple myself and the last time I went it was in 2014 right as my health was starting to decline and I just remember that being so hard and so difficult that for a long time even the thought of doing something like this again really scared me. But in the same breath, my health has improved a significant amount over the last few years and I really thought that I was in a position now where I would be well enough for a trip like this. So I do have a vlog that's coming first, but since I've got back, I had a lot of questions about cruising with a chronic illness and I made a lot of notes as I was going along. So after we've done the vlog, we're gonna sit down and have a chat about it all. I'm gonna try and figure out how to do timestamps so I can put them on, but just things you need to know before we get started. Like I said, we booked this fairly last minute and we found a really good deal. My mum has such a knack for finding the good deals with stuff like this. And because we got such a good price, we actually made the decision to upgrade the room to one with a balcony, which is something that we've never done before. Oh my gosh, I've not even said what ship. We went on the P&O Azura. It was a cruise around the Canaries and it was seven nights. Ideally, we wanted to book an accessible cabin so that I could take my power chair and have more independence. But because we booked so late, none of the accessible cabins were available. So we booked a standard room. That wasn't an issue for me. It just meant that I had to take my transit wheelchair to make sure it was thin enough to get through the doors. We were supposed to fly to Tenerife on the 23rd of December and board the ship the same day. But because because there were baggage handler strikes on that day, we did decide to fly a day earlier and we spent a night in Tenerife. Yeah, there's a lot to talk about, not just with accessibility and chronic illness, but I had an incredible experience with my food allergies. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about COVID as well because I know that's on a lot of people's minds, but we'll do all that at the end. Enjoy the vlog. So that morning we set off very early from my parents' house in Sheffield over to Manchester Airport. It's worth saying that we already had assistance booked and we did that through Cruise 2 who we booked the holiday with. I'm not going to talk too much about the airport because I definitely haven't nailed the flying with a wheelchair thing yet. It was only my second time doing it and we found the luggage situation in particular really challenging so if anybody has any advice on handling luggage alongside a transit wheelchair or in fact a power chair for that matter I would be all ears for that. But we did have time for a lovely breakfast and I swear this is always one of the highlights of flying in the morning just having that airport breakfast it always hits different doesn't it and then just out of the blue my mum spotted this door with this little sunflower symbol on it and we were intrigued so we decided to have a look inside we saw a little sign saying sunflower room and we've just come in and it's such a lovely quiet little space obviously if there was anyone else in here i wouldn't be talking or vlogging but there's comfy seats it's so much quieter in here there's a light and if you touch it a few times it like dims the room a bit oh or a lot, sorry. <laughs> and we were just walking around and I was just thinking how chaotic and energy draining it is out there. So to find something like this is amazing. I'm really impressed. And I already have my lanyard on. I'm not just doing it to be trendy. We made it safely onto the fly and it all passed quite nicely. It's about four and a half hours to get to Tenerife South, which was our destination. And I thought it was all going well until the captain announced we would be making an unplanned landing. And basically what had happened is there was a passenger incident. We thought it was a medical emergency, but it turned out the guy was just blind drunk. He was threatening staff, he was threatening passengers. Um, so they thought it best for safety reasons to land the plane. Obviously that was a decision that couldn't be avoided, but it did mean that our journey was extended quite a lot. And that was quite tough on my chronic illness symptoms symptoms, especially because I've been upright for quite a significant period of time. Um, yeah, my symptoms were flaring quite badly, but we made it there. That's the important thing. And we missed our transfer that was planned, but luckily the assistants at the other end were really good. They set us in a taxi on the way to the hotel and I was very glad to finally reach my bed. So as you might imagine, I definitely wasn't thriving the next day. I was not very well, but luckily I did have a few hours just to rest in bed and try and recharge a bit. And then it was only a short taxi journey from there to get to the port where the ship was docked. And this was our first time embarking on the P&O Azura. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the embarkation process with the mobility aid at the end of the video, but we made it on. We got our first glimpse of the ship and the beautiful surroundings. And then I found I had a little bit of burst of energy with all the excitement and I decided to do an impromptu room tour because I don't even know why, but here it is. 
So welcome to cabin D114. We are on the P&O Azura. My mum is behind the camera. I'm doing this now while I've got energy, but I just thought I'd show you the room because I don't think we've ever been in a room this nice before. It's absolutely gorgeous. So if you follow me down, we have two twin beds. We have, there's loads of space, but we've got the wheelchair here for now. Um, but we've got two twin beds. We've got a little getting ready area here, which is perfect because you always want somewhere where you can just do your makeup and get ready and stuff. So that's ideal. We've got one TV up here. We're watching the muster station safety information. We're going to do that next. Um, you don't go to the point anymore. You just watch it on the TV. So that's quite chronic illness friendly as well. It's the 23rd of December today. We've got a little Christmas present. We've got some chocolates, which is lovely, all nicely wrapped. I was also very, very excited about the tea and coffee making facilities because I didn't expect that to be there. So you can have a cup of tea in the morning, some biscuits, you've got everything you need. And then down here, we've got a really lovely little seating area. I've never experienced anything like this on a cruise ship before where the space is usually so limited. It just feels like there's so much space to spread out. And then the best bit, arguably, is through here. And I bet I'm not gonna be able to open this because I've got noodle arms. Oh, fine. It's worth saying that there are steps um, because this isn't an accessible room. This isn't an adapted room. So there are steps in and out, but through here we have got a little balcony if you'd like to come with. <laughs> and at the minute we've got a beautiful view of Tenerife. But again, this is great. So even if you don't feel well enough to go up on the deck or to be walking around the ship, you've still got a nice little area where you can come for a bit of private time. So I'm just gonna walk back through because I realised I didn't show you the bathroom and like I said this isn't one of the accessible rooms I think they've got six accessible cabins on board and they were all booked up by the time we booked but I say that because there is a little step into the bathroom and it's obviously not an adapted one but we've got a bath which I was incredibly excited about toilet towels lovely area to get ready here beautiful toiletries and stuff oh and last thing we've got lots of hanging space we've got some dressing gowns and even if you've got like medical equipment or you're bringing lots of stuff with you there are lots of storage little storage areas and there's a fridge down at the bottom as well <laughs> next day was Christmas Eve and we had such a lovely start to the day. We had a great breakfast, the weather was amazing so we headed to the top deck and we grabbed a sunbed. I've just nipped back down to the cabin and we've had a delivery. Look at how beautiful this is. We're gonna, I feel terrible, we're gonna have to get rid of it because most Christmas cakes have nuts in so neither of us can eat it. I wanted to document this as well because something quite exciting happened. It's not that exciting, I don't even know why I said that, it's only exciting to me but I swam this morning and it's something that's been on the back of my mind for a long time, like with my chronic illness. I have no idea if I could still swim or not. I, d I really didn't know. It's also very rare that I'm warm enough to get in the pool, even on holiday, but it's been, the weather has been so lovely here. We're just in the port today in Tenerife, so we haven't actually sailed anywhere yet. And I just felt the urge to do it. And I just got in the pool and I swam. And when I say swam, I mean like five strokes and then I got out again. And even with that, I can really feel it. So I might not, might not be as happy about this tomorrow morning, but yeah first time in about eight nine years maybe that's wild <laughs> it really doesn't feel like christmas eve today like that's not your typical view on christmas eve in the uk but it's been a good one so far we have been unable to contact the unidentified inbound aircraft which appears to be heading towards azura we are however continuously monitoring its movements on the radar we have also taken the added precautions of posting additional lookouts on the bridge. Aww. But as of yet, nothing has been sighted. It is red and has a distinct sound of jingly bells and ho ho ho! did not realise there were other people out there on their balconies who could see me and hear me, but we live and we learn. <laughs> And this is where things started to take a bit of a turn. When the ship started moving more rapidly, I started to feel very unwell. And the rest of Christmas Eve night and most of Christmas day, I was not very well at all, unfortunately. I did make it to the top deck again because I found that being outside helped. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. But I did manage to get dressed for the celebration night. And there's a clip here of me trying to look less ill than I felt. <laughs> Christmas. 
Good morning, it is Madeira day today. It's Boxing Day. I have not been very well for the last few days. Um, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day were a struggle, but I'm feeling much better today. We're docked in Madeira. It looks quite chilly and quite rainy to be honest, but we are gonna get off and have a little wander in the town before we get back on. So I'll see what I can film. Oh, and we're gonna try and do the toboggan ride. We don't know if it's gonna be doable with a transit wheelchair, but that's the thing I'm really hoping we get to do today, but we'll see how we go. So as soon as we disembarked in Madeira, we saw they had lots of shuttle buses available and we were immediately directed to an accessible one, which was ring fence for people with mobility aids, which was great. It was four euros each way, but it was a really good job we got on this because as we made our way through to the town, we saw how cobbly the pavement was, even along the dock and just coming out of the port area. So getting the bus was definitely a good shout. Unfortunately, the toboggan rides that we wanted to do weren't running on this day, but we decided to go up in the fun child cable cars anyway. It's, I'm not even gonna lie, I am a little bit scared of stuff like this. I really love the experience, but I do get a little bit nervous around heights, but I was amazed at how accessible the building and the cable cars themselves were. I decided to get out of my transit wheelchair and one of the assistants put it on for me, but it did look like there was level access for people using power chairs as well. And it was really beautiful views. It went up very high. I was very scared, but the views were incredible. When we got to the top, we were debating doing the Monte Palace, I believe it's called. It's like a big sort of multi-level botanical garden. It's got beautiful exotic trees and flowers. It looked great and it looked fairly accessible, but it was quite hilly. And because we had the transit wheelchair and we'd already had quite a tiring day and I wasn't at my best, we decided not to do that. Instead, we headed to a really lovely coffee shop called Land. It had amazing views. The staff was so lovely and the food was great. After that, we headed back down in the cable car. I should say as well, in case it's of interest it was a 36 euro return for two people so quite pricey but you are on there for quite a long time each way and after that we decided to have a wander through the town center and Madeira oh it's such a gorgeous place and it's somewhere I'd really love to go back to it's not the most accessible on the surface because it's really cobbly and really historical but I was really impressed at how many of the amenities had thought about access and were clearly welcoming of disabled people so I'd definitely like to spend more time there one day we had a look in the Christmas market with some beautiful handmade things from local people and after that we headed back to the ship. Something really cool about the room is that they come with binoculars if you want to have a better look at things. So earlier I thought I saw a dolphin just outside in the bay floating around so I had a look at it. I was staring at it for at least 20 minutes and it turned out it was a plastic bag. It's just coming up to half past five. The fact I'm still alive enough to be vlogging means I'm doing much better than I have been doing for previous days. But we're just going to go off to dinner shortly. We have any time dining which means we can just walk in whenever we want but we found that it does get quite busy and it takes a while so we do try and go for around six-ish when it opens. The dress code has been mostly smart casual which is nice. We had one black tie evening yesterday on Christmas day but naturally because I was not thriving I got one picture of that which I think says it all. <coughs> But yeah, there's quite a lot of variability in how people are dressed, but it does feel very comfortable. It doesn't feel really like formal and strict and stuff. So problems I did not expect to have. I've got my heels stuck in my wheelchair. I can't get my heel out. I think this shoe just lives here now. We are in La Palma today. To nobody's surprise, yesterday was another poorly day, so I wasn't on top form, I didn't film anything, but I'm feeling much better today. And hopefully we're gonna find um, a black sand beach. Um, apparently the beaches and the coastal area is really beautiful on this island, so I'm excited to see a little bit more of that. On this day, they put on a free shuttle bus for passengers with reduced mobility, which was amazing, although it wasn't wheelchair accessible. Not a problem for me because of the transit, but wouldn't have been suitable for everybody and other passengers got on as well. So it was in fact just a bus, but we were appreciative of it because it was about a 10 minute walk to get to the town center. Now La Palma is another gorgeous volcanic island. The architecture is beautiful. It's stunning to look around, but again, it was not great with the transit wheelchair. It wasn't very accessible and it was actually really painful. So after a bit, we did turn around and go back. Well, we're back on the ship. That didn't go quite how we planned it. We went to the old town because it wasn't quite beach weather and it was not the most wheelchair accessible place and I don't know why I was surprised by that and I'm, I 
I've been a bit lax with this whole holiday. I haven't done my research as much as I would usually do. I've been winging it partially because we have the transit wheelchair. With the power chair, you do have to be a lot more on it with research in advance just to get from A to B. But I thought because we had the transit, we'd have a bit more flexibility. But what I am finding in most of these places is that it is very, very difficult to get around. It is very cobbly, very beautiful, but very cobbly. And it's just hard work for both of us. And yeah, just, I'm just a bit drained so um we didn't go to the beach I've come back I think we've we can obviously like go and sunbathe and stuff but I think I'm just going to spend a bit of time in the room um you might be able to tell but I'm just not thriving <laughs> I'm not doing very well I'm not feeling at my best but we're just doing a little bit at a time and we're just going to see how we go and I'll just find the enjoyment where I can but if you are going to be stuck inside with all your usual symptoms playing up and some moderately concerning chest pain, there are definitely worse views to do it to because that is so beautiful. Okay, don't hold me to it, but I'm going to try and vlog this evening. Hopefully I'm going to feel okay. It's generally been that the evenings have been when I felt at my worst when we're sailing, but we've not moved anywhere yet. So I'll get as ready as much as possible while we're stationary. That seems to be the tip. Try not to do too much and walk back and forth too much while we're in motion. But we're sailing away at about half five, so I'm going to try and watch that. I'm going to get changed. We're going to sit down and have some dinner. And then there is a Motown show on in the, in the theatre tonight. Fingers crossed I'm going to make it to that. I'm actually going to make it to one tonight. <laughs> dinner we saw the comedian who was great we saw the show i had a mocktail i thought i'm not pushing it with the alcohol but i've managed a full night and that's the important thing and i'm not feeling too terrible actually although i'm very ready for a lay down again now good morning welcome to Fort Ventura. we pulled up early this morning it's a much bigger island so it was a really nice sailing and we could see it from a distance from quite a way away we've just had a really nice breakfast they've just announced that the gangway's open so you can make your way onto the land and we are hopefully going to find a beach today Fort Ventura was our shortest day in port which was a shame because the weather was beautiful and we both really enjoyed this day we disembarked as soon as we could and we were armoured up for navigating access barriers after our last few experiences but the seafront around this area was actually really flat and really lovely to push a wheelchair on. We asked about nearby beaches and we were told there was a great one about five to seven minutes walk away so we headed there. There was an amazing ramp leading down to the sand so it was easy to access and in the distance I could see this little hut and I was thinking to myself that looks like a beach wheelchair I wonder what that is and as we got closer we found all kinds of treats so let me tell you a bit about that now. We've just got to the beach and this is such an added bonus. We found this whole little area. There's no sunbeds or anything on the rest of the beach, but there's this little hut behind me and it's reserved for people with limited mobility and they've got two beach wheelchairs. They've got some sort of like crutch that I think is designed for sand. It's really cool and it's really comfy and it means I can get on the sand. It does mean that everyone's staring at me as they walk past, but you gotta do what you gotta do. I'm really pleased with this. Sometimes it's just seeing access measures like this that can give you such a boost, especially when you're not expecting to see them. And even the lifeguards came over and they said, this is one of the wheelchairs that floats. So if you want us to take you out into the sea, we will do that. And I just thought that was so cool and so lovely. And to be honest, the reason I didn't do it on this day is because I just couldn't hack all the people staring at me. Some days you're more resilient to it than other days. And today was not one of those days. On reflection, I do kind of wish I had done it now, but there we go. We both had a great time regardless, really enjoyed it and when we were ready we had a stroll back to the ship. I'm doing some risky vlogging on a balcony here because I don't think anybody's out and I don't think they're listening but I just wanted to say how cool the beach was earlier. We didn't know that any of the accessibility stuff was there but just having that ramp and just having those measures in place and like an actual area of what turned out to be a really busy beach that was kind of ring fence for people with limited mobility was so cool. 
it wasn't long before my suspicions were confirmed and I saw a few people trying to take the mic and trying to get the equipment for themselves. When the lifeguard came over I did wonder if she was going to tell me to move because obviously I'm an ambulatory wheelchair user, I do stand up and move around but um, she went straight to the other person who'd sat himself down on one who was definitely non-disabled because I don't like to make assumptions but he was definitely non-disabled and she told him just to sling his hook and then she came over to me and I thought she was either going to ask me to move or to pay for the equipment and she just said if you want to go in the sea just let us know and we'll take you out there in, in the wheelchair because apparently it floats as well and I just thought that was so cool. It's been a really lovely day today and it's a shame that this is the shortest one in port because we're going to start moving in about an hour and a half and I'm trying to get as much done as possible just in case I feel really ill again but really gorgeous weather today. It's a few hours later now, we've had dinner, I completely forgot I was vlogging as per usual. We keep going past different islands in the Canaries as we sail back towards Tenerife, so it's completely pitch black outside, but every now and then you see like a little cluster of lights and you're going past another island. I don't think it's going to come up very well, but I am going to try and show you without compromising my phone in like the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> Just want it on record that I actually am at sea and feeling okay today, so miracles do exist. The next morning it was time to disembark so we left the ship for the final time and got in our transfer back to the airport. So if you were just here for the vlog I really hope you enjoyed it. I hope you consider subscribing to see future videos and if you're sticking around let's have a good old chat about access, allergies, covid, chronic illness, all fun stuff like that. So I'm sharing this information in the hope it will be helpful for anybody who's planning or considering a similar trip. I'm not going to talk too much about the travel because I don't feel like I've nailed it yet. We booked assistance when we booked the holiday through Cruise 2 so all of that was taken care of but I think I'm going to try and get a little bit more experience of flying with my chronic illness and flying with a wheelchair before I try and offer any advice on that front which I hope you understand. I'm going to get this one out of the way first things first. I do think it's important to talk about Covid. Um, for context if you're new I am somewhat vulnerable. I am not shielding three years in the way that a lot of my friends are, but I am still being very careful. I'm making decisions on a case by case basis and I am still wearing a mask a lot of the time. I don't mind telling you that ahead of this holiday, I was very, very worried about COVID. On a cruise ship, you're in quite close confinement with quite a lot of people. So in my head, I was thinking if one person gets something, we're all gonna get it. So the first thing I want to say is that the destinations you're visiting on the cruise ship might have their own restrictions in place. We were in the Canaries and they still have a requirement for masks to be worn on public transport transport and for masks to be worn in doctor surgeries and pharmacies and I thought that was great. It was unfortunate to see tourists ignoring those rules when it didn't suit them. Um, it didn't surprise me to be honest but it was it did make me really sad to see that. Just be aware that where you're visiting might have different restrictions to where you're from. As for the cruise ship, when we first boarded and they made the announcements about the muster stations, there was an announcement to give general information about the ship and the itinerary. They did make a point of talking about Covid in that announcement and again it did make me really sad that a lot of people didn't even stop talking to listen to it. On this particular ship at this time of year there were lots of viruses going around. We didn't hear about any Covid cases but although there wasn't Covid as far as I'm aware there were lots of viruses and lots of coughing and lots of sneezing. Again I'm getting all of this done at the beginning because I don't like being negative but it, when you're in close confinement with people especially British people it seems you really see the lack of the lack of hygiene habits I suppose. I saw some things I really wish I hadn't seen and like I said you're in close confinement with these people you would think that they would be doing the bare minimum to look after themselves and protect others but unfortunately that isn't always the case and I say that because it is something to be aware of if you are immunocompromised or vulnerable. Something I was quite surprised by as well is that when I've been on cruise ships in the past even long before Covid they the staff have always been very on it with the hand sanitizer like usually they will not let you into a communal area unless you've sanitized first they are very militant about it which I think is really good and really important and bizarrely that wasn't the case on this one and I don't know if that is a P&O specific thing or if something that's changed over the last few years but they definitely weren't enforcing the hand sanitizer as much as I would have thought or I would have liked to have seen the only time that changed was towards the end of the holiday when even more people were coughing including staff that's when they did sort of get people out holding the hand sanitizer and trying to enforce that a bit more firmly anyway that's covid done and dusted i hope that's helpful if you are hoping to 
travel a bit more and have more holidays this year but you don't feel like it's doable please know you have my complete empathy i still feel a little bit weird about it all i'm so glad and so grateful for the experience and i do feel like i'm in a place where i'd be comfortable doing it again but i totally appreciate that won't be the case for everybody food allergies this is good because now i get to be a lot more positive because i had a really great experience on board pino azura dining with multiple and severe food allergies in a nutshell i mainly avoid peanuts tree nuts milk and eggs peanuts I am severely allergic to and that's life-threatening nuts I'm normal allergic to milk and egg are just intolerances but if I have a little bit it makes my chronic illness symptoms a lot worse so I do avoid that completely as well in addition to that I have something called oral allergy syndrome that means I have allergic reactions to a lot of raw fruit and veg as well but I generally just manage and mitigate that where I can it's not as essential as the others because the reactions are annoying but they won't hurt me over the longer term now obviously traveling and dining with multiple food allergies like this isn't easy and it's important to inform people where you can we did inform the travel agent when we were booking through cruise 2 but my experience showed me that it's really important that you go out of your way to inform somebody on board as well i don't know what their official title was they were a chef they were in the kitchen and they were one of the more senior people it was during that conversation that we were informed that i would need to pre-order my meals this was the first we'd heard of this we had no idea we were quite naive about it but they explained that for lunch if we chose to do it and dinner evening meal I would be given the menu the previous night and I would be asked to pick what I wanted the following night which meant that they had a heads up and they could make sure they prepared that completely separately. In my experience I found there are pros and cons to pre-ordering in this way. The pros is that you obviously know that they're taking your allergens really seriously, they're being prepared completely separately and it's good to have that weight off your mind. The cons are that it's not always easy to pick what you're going to fancy the next day, the night before. There were many cases where I thought, oh, I wish I hadn't picked that, I wish I could change my mind. And I think that's something that's particularly true when you have a chronic illness, because often the symptoms you're experiencing on that day dictate what you feel you can and want to eat. But on reflection, I think, although that was annoying at times, I think the most important thing is that they were taking these allergens seriously and exercising really good practice in that front. I did write down that sometimes we did have conflict in information about what and how we should be pre-ordering. We got told different things about the breakfast, for example, different staff seemed to have different ideas of what we should be doing and how we should be doing it. But by the end of the trip, we had got into quite a good rhythm. We found that we tended to go to the same places around the same time, and I'll talk more about that in a bit. But because we got to know the staff there and they were familiar with the situation, we got to the point where we had a nice routine. They'd get the soya milk out and the soya butter out as soon as they saw me wheeling in. And it felt like a lot less effort. And because sometimes even communicating your needs like that can be really tiring and take a lot of exertion. So just having that sense of routine was something that I found really helpful. It was also the case on board that some places were better than others. So nowhere was bad. And obviously any food on a cruise ship is gonna be amazing. But in one restaurant on board, it was very much a case of here is what is safe for you, this is what you will eat, being safe is the priority, as of course it should be. But in another one, we had a much better experience because yes, they were as on it with the safety, but they also made a point of asking me what I wanted to eat and what I liked to eat. And they really went out of their way to make sure that my experience was as similar as possible to the people around me. In the former restaurant, if I wanted bread, they would just give me like the, you know, you've all seen them if you've got allergies, the square of allergen free bread and it's not that nice. Um, but in the other one they actually managed to find a bread roll I could have that was safe for me but it was a lot nicer and it resembled what the people around me were eating and sometimes it's little things like that that can make all the difference. We met some really amazing staff during this holiday particularly in regards to the food allergies and I should I just want to make it clear that we have fed that back to P&O. I think it's so important that when people do a really good job they get recognition for that so we fed it back with all of their names and I really really hope it reaches them. This is an age-old tip, but if you're travelling with allergies, it can be really helpful to print some little allergy cards from home. I've got a bit of a bone to pick with this one, because I swear, pre-Covid, when I was last travelling, you used to be able to get them all online for free, and yet when I went online to do these ones, some places are charging £20 plus for them now, which is wild, but I did manage to find some free ones. But essentially, they're little translation cards, and they have the English on one side, and then the language of the country you're visiting on the other side, and it basically says, this person has allergies, she can't have this, this and this, please take this seriously they always always come in so handy not just because of the language barrier but again in terms of saving exertion you just hand over the card and it saves having having that back and forth as much 
So this is something that I showed to the staff at the start of the cruise and also during the travel day. But once we'd done that once off, they recorded it next to my room number. So that information went with me wherever I went and it saved me having to do it again, which is something else that I think was really, really good practice. I think the only real issue I had with the allergies was that I knew everybody on board was a really talented chef and they were going out of their way to make amazing food but I also know that the staff on cruise ships are under so much pressure and they put up with so much rubbish from the passengers and again I'm not going to go on a rant but British people were so unnecessarily rude and it just makes me so sad. I'm not even joking there was almost a big fight at one point when somebody tried to like push in the queue I honestly thought there was going to be a physical altercation. Even when you're eating and listening to people on the table around you the way that other people sometimes talk to the staff and the way they acted just did not sit right with me that's something that has always happened I've always observed that on cruise ships and it makes me really really uncomfortable and as a result of that I often don't want to ask anything that people have to go out of their way for because I know they're already dealing with so much they don't want an allergic to life like girl who could explode at any minute <laughs> And because of that, I sometimes wondered and worried about what to ask for because they were saying things like, oh, choose your stuff, let us know if you want anything special. But I was thinking, I don't want to tell them I want something special and make them go out of their way for it, but I would like a treat since they've been so good and it's so rare that I get to experience good food like that. By the end of the trip, with the help of a staff member called April, we had found quite a good routine that seemed to work for both parties. So with things like dessert, she would say, what do you want? And I would say, surprise me, chef's choice and they would, they would enjoy that, they would go away and think of something and it meant that they could do something that was convenient to them on that day. They didn't have to go out of their way for it and I still got a really amazing dessert out of it. To give you an idea of the food I was eating actually, so we had the anytime dining and that means you get a three course meal every night which is amazing. Starters for me, oh I should say as well something really important. So when I'm at home, I try and eat vegan as much as I can. When I'm at home, I'd say my diet these days is around 80% vegan, but sometimes it's just not possible having all of these food allergies. So I really, really don't beat myself up when I can't do it. And on this holiday, it was usually the case that I couldn't do it. So I did eat meat on this holiday. I ate a lot more meat than usual, but you have to do what you have to do. Just thought I'd say that for context in case you've watched any of my other videos. So starters for me generally look like things like tomato soup. They did like little chicken and bacon arranged on a plate. I had a prawn cocktail on Christmas day. For mains, I had things like chicken with vegetables, steak, they did a amazing chips. I did sometimes have the vegan option so like roasted vegetables and edamame with balsamic that was delicious and then the desserts are where they really really excelled themselves and this was so exciting for me because again remember how many allergies I have. I was having things like sticky toffee pudding, ice cream and there was one day where I'd said chef surprise and I didn't know what they were bringing out and they walked over and I saw thick fluffy American pancakes with syrup and banana on and I genuinely could have cried. It was like the best thing ever and I was absolutely buzzing and just so grateful for that. It really really just made the experience even more special. If you're watching this and you have less severe allergies so perhaps cross-contamination is less of an issue for you and you're thinking that perhaps you don't need all of these measures, the other really amazing thing I saw on board is that in the buffet areas all of the labels that described the food that was under them had the allergens labelled on them and I cannot tell you, again I was absolutely buzzing, I mean if you've watched my other vlogs you will know I wish that is something that hotels and buffets in the UK would do more. So if you are dining with less severe allergies or intolerances or you go into the buffet you can just look and you can just see with your own eyes what's suitable for you. Obviously with it being a buffet there is a risk of cross-contamination. I will be honest, even though there was a cross-contamination risk I did sneak into the buffet sometimes. I don't make decisions like that lightly. When you live with allergies you learn how to make a million assessment decisions in a split second and obviously that's something I've been negotiating for a while. I've lived with my allergies for many many years now um, so I did sneak into the buffet and can confirm the food is really good there too and the reason we did that is obviously I could pre-order for my lunch like we were doing for the dinner but because the meals are such a spectacle and that's really lovely and something I like, going for lunch every day in that environment would take another hour out of our day um, so we just if we wanted to make the most of the day we didn't always have time to put that in which is why I would sometimes sneak into the buffet and make a sensible choice for me, usually get some chips and obviously I wouldn't advocate doing that. If there's any risk of cross-contamination and you have severe allergies I wouldn't advocate doing that but 
it was the right decision for me in that moment. The other thing to say is that you can have soya milk delivered to your room. We did this on the first day. Room service brought down some soya milk so that I could have a cup of tea in the room and there was no charge for that. So if you need alternative milk, don't be afraid to request it. Oh, there's so many things I could say and I feel like this is gonna to be too long. So maybe I'll do a blog post in the future, but three tips if you're dining with a food allergy on a P&O cruise. If like me, you're pre-ordering, it means that your meal is being prepared separately and really safely, um, but that can take longer, so be prepared to wait. On a similar note, we found it more comfortable requesting a separate table rather than sharing, which is the thing that sometimes happens on cruise ships. You get put on a table with strangers because in that situation, you all order together. And on the time that did happen with me, it meant that the whole rest of the table had to wait until they prepared mine and were ready to bring mine out. And I felt so guilty and so terrible for the other people. So um, if that's something you want to avoid or you find it more comfortable being on your own, especially if you have very severe allergies and there's the airborne risk, it's definitely worth requesting a separate table and making the people aware of that before you're seated. And finally, whenever you're traveling with food allergies, I always think it's worth taking some safe snacks in your suitcase just so you know they're there. It means that you can have something even if you're hungry and you can't access food otherwise. It might be that there's something you crave. So they made they said from the start that they wouldn't be serving me any chocolate because it wasn't safe and it made me extra glad that my mum had packed some for me in my suitcase because sometimes you just need a bit of chocolate don't you next i'm going to talk about accessibility and hopefully this should be done a lot more speedily like i said at the start we didn't have an accessible cabin we booked really late and all of the accessible cabins were booked up it wasn't a problem for me because i don't need all of the facilities it would have just been a case that i could take a better wheelchair but if you do require an accessible cabin i would advise booking early to make sure you get in there first we saw a lot of people with mobility aids on board so it's definitely worth doing that generally speaking i thought the access on the ship was very good obviously there's a lot of ramps they clearly paid attention to it pretty much everything is level access we did have a bit of trouble with the transit wheelchair just getting over some bumps and along the carpet sometimes but i think that's definitely not a problem unique to this cruise ship. Something that surprised me is that we didn't have to fight for the lift space as much as I expected. So usually in my experience on a cruise ship, it's really hard to get in a lift because they're always full of passengers. There's a lot of stairs and a lot of decks on cruise ships, so everybody tries to get in the lift. And I thought that with the wheelchair, we would probably have to wait a lot longer, but surprisingly, that didn't really happen as much as I expected it to, so that was a big positive. If you're using mobility aids, um, it's sometimes a bit difficult to get through the corridors where all the rooms are because there are cleaning trolleys there but in the same breath the staff are really conscious of this and they always make a point of putting those cleaning trolleys as close to the wall as possible and that alone is completely different to my general experience with hotels in the UK where the cleaners just generally leave it in the middle of the thing and no one can get around it and you're just kind of stuck there. So I wrote down here that it's important to think about the mobility aids you're taking carefully. I was initially really really sad that I couldn't take my power chair because that would have really improved the experience to me. I really don't enjoy being pushed around in the transit. I don't like the lack of autonomy. But the first time I saw the embarkation process, so where you go from the land onto the ship, I looked at the ramp and I thought there is absolutely no way my power chair could have got up that ramp. It was about the steepness of the ramps to get on the trains in the UK. And my power chair struggles even with that small distance and it needs a shove. Um, they did have assistance there and oh my goodness the assistance guys were always so so brilliant whenever you were embarking or disembarking and you had mobility aids um, someone would just speak into a walkie-talkie and then I swear seconds later the assistance would appear so it was always timely they were always friendly and because I had my transit wheelchair the assistance for me usually meant that these two guys or gals one would take the back of the wheelchair and one would take the front and they would guide me backwards um, again that sounds like something that would usually really scare me and make me uncomfortable but I did feel very safe with these guys actually and without that I genuinely don't know how me and my mum would have managed to get the transit wheelchair up the ramps onto the cruise ship so if you're traveling with mobility aids it's worth researching that embarkation and disembarkation process and making sure it's going to be doable with your particular aid. I would actually be really interested to know if anybody's watching this and they have done it with a power chair and they know how it works I'd really be interested to hear that because I didn't see anybody else doing it. On that same note there was sometimes mixed information about where passengers with disabilities were supposed to disembark. Sometimes we would be told one thing by one member of staff and then we'd need to go somewhere else um, so there was a bit of inconsistency in that front um, which we have fed back. In the ports you might have picked up on this from my vlog but I definitely didn't do as much research as I should have done or as I would normally do. I was very sort of very much sort of winging it all when in reality I wish I'd gone away and put a bit more effort in before we got there. Sometimes the port where the ship is docked and the end of the docking 
station. I'm not good with the lingo, forgive me. Sometimes that's quite a long walk and something good that P&O sometimes did is put on mobility buses or just buses in general where people could get on the bus and it would take them to the end of it and save some of that walking distance which I think is great especially for people who might have mobility issues but don't use mobility aids. Again sadly this was a bit inconsistent so sometimes they said there would be buses and they weren't, um, there'd be confusion over whether it was a mobility bus or a general bus, whether it was free, um, like I said people didn't always wear masks even though that was the law there so again a bit of inconsistency there. It made me smile to see a few people on board wearing sunflower lanyards. I don't really know how that experience was for them, but somebody I did talk to said that in the airport um, and in Tenerife in general, they were really receptive to the sunflower lanyards for less visible disabilities, which I thought was really great to know. And finally for access, I wanted to finish with a really positive one, and that was that I picked up that the staff had had great disability awareness training. So when I was talking to a member of staff, they talked back to me. When I was dealing with something, they dealt with me. They didn't look to my mum, they didn't talk to my my mum or my companion and perhaps that sounds like quite a little thing but stuff like that can make a really big difference and I thought that was a really big really really big point in their favour. And finally I'm going to talk about chronic illness, the biggie, and I think it's important to recognise that access and disability in general doesn't always generalise to the unique challenges of chronic illness, especially with things like travelling. Now everybody experiences chronic illness differently, in different severities, different lifestyles, but the important thing to say first off is that travelling with a chronic illness is always going to be difficult. No matter how much planning you do, how many adjustments are in place, I think that just being in a new environment that you have less control over is something that's always going to be tough and I do think you have to mentally prepare yourself for that. Even if it's a holiday, it's still going to be hard. Since I've got back, the thing that people have asked me more than anything else is how I got on with the motion sickness and what it was like when the ship was moving. Like I touched on earlier, I did do a cruise when I was starting to get really unwell and I found it really, really tough. But because I have experienced a lot of improvement, I thought I'd be a bit more resilient to that this time and that it wouldn't affect me so much. And I was badly mistaken. <laughs> So when the ship was stationary, I was absolutely great and I absolutely loved it. But the majority of time when it was sailing, I had a really, really hard time. I'm going to touch on motion sickness and seasickness here, not in a graphic way or in the way you might expect, but I will put a timestamp on screen if, if you want to skip to that now. So what I experienced when the ship was moving, I don't think was seasickness because I've had seasickness before, before I got ill and I could remember what that felt like, but it was definitely a form of motion sickness. And I think the reason I struggled so much was because that seemed to intersect with my chronic illness symptoms. The best way I can describe it, if you have autonomic dysfunction, is you know when you stand up too quickly and sometimes it feels like all of the pressure in your body goes to your head and your head feels really heavy. That's kind of what it felt like most of the time. So as well as all my usual symptoms, I would definitely had an increase in dizziness. Um, I felt like my proprioception was a bit wonky sometimes. I mean, I get dizzy on dry land, so I don't know why I was surprised by this. I don't think my fatigue was any worse than normal, but I did find that I needed to lie down more. I needed to have my feet elevated more than usual. And that was one of the things that really helped me. So I do, I do think it was mainly autonomic, the struggles I was experiencing this time. And like I said, I don't think it was seasickness, but traditional remedies for seasickness did partially help. So I had the travel bands. I like, for all I know, it could be psychological, but they definitely helped me in the car. And I think they helped me a little bit on the ship as well. And then on board, we also purchased some seasickness tablets. The first night we realized we were in for a rough ride. Um, oh yeah, I should talk about that. So I'm saying I struggled with the travel, but there were a few extenuating circumstances on the journey I was on. So on the first night, really sadly, um, Christmas Eve going into Christmas Day, there was an incident on board. Somebody fell very, very ill. And the plan before that had been to sail gradually through the night. The captain was gonna go around a storm so that we got good weather and it was all gonna be nice and calm. But when that incident happened, it was obviously the most important thing to get to land as soon as possible so that the, people, the person could be taken to hospital. And that meant on the first night of sailing to get to Madeira, we sailed at full speed through a storm. And even for seasoned travelers, that was hard. And looking back now, I'm really surprised. Well, obviously I coped with it because in that situation, you have no choice but to cope, that's the thing. But even on the days when there weren't circumstances like that and even on the calmer days where the weather was better I did still find it really difficult so it still feels really important to say this stuff. I did get slightly more used to it over time I think and the last days of the holiday you might have seen were a lot better than the first days so perhaps there's an adjustment period 
but I just, it's a really, really tough one because on the one hand, cruising is such a great way to travel when you have a chronic illness because it takes away the exertion of flying and traveling to separate places. You've got everything you need where you need it. But on the other hand, if you are considering a trip like this, I do think it's important to consider how the motion of being at sea will interact with your symptoms and plan in advance how you might mitigate that. The other thing with regard to chronic illness is that being a passenger on a cruise ship is quite a social thing. A lot of people will talk and I do really like that. You do have a lot of conversations with people and you get to know people but if you've not prepared for that or you've not experienced it before I think it's important to keep a little bit of energy back for socializing and socializing more than you might expect to just just to be aware of that so I've got five tips for cruising with a chronic illness number one when you're on board get as much as possible done before the ship starts sailing so when you're at sea, you want to minimise your movement as much as possible. You don't want to be walking back and forth because that will make it worse. So I always tried to get as prepared as possible or as ready as possible while we were stationary so that when we did start moving, I could spend more time lying down and I was going back and forth and I had less to do. And that was something that made a big difference. Number two, if you have to drink a lot of water, either due to your condition or due to your medication, you have to be aware that there isn't water in the room and it's obviously not safe to drink from taps. So I drink a lot of water a day and the way we got around this, um, they try and encourage you to pay for like a water subscription, but it's ridiculously expensive. Take a personal water bottle. I think it needs to be a clear one if you're traveling but take a water bottle and although you can't fill these up directly from the water dispensers obviously for hygiene reasons take it up with you get one of the plastic cups next to it put the water in that and decant it into your bottle because then you've got some that you can take down and take away with you and you're not running short number three this won't be suitable and it won't appeal to everybody consider paying to choose your room so if you pay a certain amount once you've booked you can select the cabin that you want rather than the one you're automatically allocated it's tricky because because I don't like recommending things that come with an extra cost but when you have a chronic illness I do think that that location of the cabin plays a really key role in how you manage your holiday. If you struggle with standing and walking but you don't use mobility aids you might want to pick a room that is closer to the lifts, the elevators. Whereas if noise is an issue, you might want a room that's further away from the lifts because there are fewer people walking past and there's less foot traffic. I'm really, really glad that my mum suggested paying to choose our own room because we saw once we, on, we were on board that the room I was originally allocated was on the main deck on the top of the ship. And it's a room that every single person on the ship has to walk past if they want to get to the pool area or the buffet. So it was incredibly loud. There was music all day. And I am so thankful that we managed to avoid that because that that's something I would have found really tough. My mum, like I said earlier, is a seasoned cruiser. She's a lot more experienced than me. And when I was talking to her about this video, her advice is if you have a chronic illness, make sure you pick a cabin that has other cabins above it. So you don't want to be underneath an entertainment venue or a theatre because a lot of the noise carries through. You want to pick a cabin that's underneath a row that just has other cabins on it. And you can usually find a layout of the ship online and that's how you can figure out what's what and where's where. Number four is definitely a lesson I've learned for next time and that is to plan your time in each port in advance and not try to wing it like I did. I think if you really want to get the most out of that short time on land you should look into things in advance that you're not dithering or getting stuck once you're there. Usually cruise liners offer shore excursions and they always sound like really amazing experiences but I'll be honest they are usually quite pricey. It's not something that we generally do because of the price point so it might be cheaper to look elsewhere and book your own. But something I did really like about P&O's shore excursions like when you could browse them online it told you a good level of detail about what was involved and also the level of activity that was re required from each person. So there was one excursion that we very nearly did which was an open top 4x4 around La Palma which would have been so cool but I did see online that it had a moderate level of activity and that's because there was a one hour walk involved in it and because it was a volcanic, volcanic island obviously that wasn't suitable for me but I was really glad that that information was there and up front and I thought that was something that P&O did really really well. So yeah if I ever do a trip like this again in the future I'm definitely going to plan it more meticulously regardless of which mobility aid I choose to take. And number five kind of relates to that and that's to choose your mobility aid carefully. So look into what the embarkation and disembarkation process is 
consider how you might be using a mobility aid on board. I really thought that once I'd got on board, I, did, I wouldn't need my wheelchair to get from A to B. I thought I would be fine walking most of the time, but cruise ships are big old ships. And I was really surprised to find that I needed my wheelchair more often than not. So that's something to be aware of. And I don't have concrete information on this. I'll try and see what I can find out, but I'm pretty sure that on most cruise ships, you can rent mobility equipment. And the reason I say that is because traveling with a wheelchair can be difficult. So if you can manage the travel day, but you're worried about getting about once you're there, it might be that renting equipment is the better option for you so it's definitely worth looking into oh my goodness I so badly wanted this to be concise but I've been talking for so long it's so tricky because you don't want to take up people's time but if you are planning a trip like this I just want I just want to get the information out there and I just want to share the experience in case it's helpful because I always find listening to other people's experiences really really valuable it goes without saying that Although this trip was under very difficult circumstances and it wasn't easy for my mum and I for a lot of reasons, I'm so glad we went. It was definitely the right call for us. I had a really great time and I'm open to doing it again in the future. I found it tough, but I've not completely written it off. If you are a cruiser by any chance and you have any recommendations for places with calmer waters or where people might get on better, um, I'd really, really love to hear them actually. And if you do have any more questions, I will try my best to answer them in the comments. I am by no means experienced, but I'll do what I can. And I think all that's left to say is thank you so much for watching. Thank you for being here. You can subscribe if you want and I'll see you next time.